We heard from Xi Jinping saying that, you know, he's pushing back on uh, ideological prejudice, pushing back on a possible Cold War. What do you make of the tone of his speech? And what could it possibly mean for U.S.-China relationship under the Biden administration? Thank you very much. I, I listened to President Xi's uh, address to the virtual Davos meeting, and I think the message has been very clear and the tone is very positive. China is looking forward to be working with all of the countries in the world, including the United States, to push for multilateral approach to solving, to solving global issues, such as the climate change, uh, pandemic, and I, I think uh, uh, this should be uh, understood as a very, very good gesture of China towards the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, President Biden's administration in the United States. How much of a reset in relations can be expected when there's so much skepticism uh, towards China in terms of how it's approach Hong Kong, in terms of how it's approach uh, Xinjiang province, also the way uh, COVID-19 was, uh, was, was, was handled? I think there's uh, broad common ground for China and the United States where to work together. And particularly when the humans are faced with such tough challenges of climate change and the pandemic, it was very hard to harness. So uh, I, would, uh, I would be uh, very positive uh, about this. Uh, I think at this moment, probably it's, it's very much important for uh, both countries to uh, push aside some of the differences and focus on the common ground. Uh, President Jin, you've always said, you've always told me that the door remains open to the US joining the AIIB. Uh, does that still hold? Is that still the case? And has there been any yeah. outreach? Will there be any outreach from, from the bank uh, to your counterparts in the US? You see, uh, AIB was initiated by China with the support of 57 founding members. Now, the membership has grown to be 103. And as I said on numerous occasions, that uh, AIB is inclusive. AIB's door is open to all of the countries which uh, would like to join. So once the door is flung open, it will remain that way. And uh, indeed, uh, I, I also said, uh, regardless of the membership of some of these countries, uh, we in AIB really would like to keep a very good working relationship with the financial institutions, with the business companies of those countries, which are not members. As you see, we have a policy which is uh, uh, open to the all, all the professionals of any nationality and uh, international competitive bidding, which does not exclude non-members companies. So this policy will never change. And I actually, I'm very pleased about the working relationship of our bank with American regulatory bodies, financial institutions, and I would encourage American real sector business. Uh, President Jing, do you foresee? And I, I can assure you, mm, they would be treated fairly. Okay, I was just going to ask if you foresee now, on the back of the pandemic, obviously the pandemic is still raging in many parts of the world, do you foresee greater coordination between infrastructure banks and policy banks like the AIIB, the private sector, uh, and their own competitors? Is that closer coordination, synchronization going to happen? You see, uh, throughout the uh, process of dealing with COVID-19 pandemic, we worked very closely with the World Bank, ADB, and other uh, institutions. Uh, so this indicates that in dealing with the global challenge, all of the stakeholders, all of the partners should really work together. So I'm, you know, we have really enjoyed a very good cooperation with the Bretton Woods institutions. And uh, I don't think there's any competition uh, between us. President Jin, the AIIB has just marked its fifth year anniversary. You're marking your uh, second term uh, as president of the AIIB as well, at a time when the world has embarked on a pretty uneven recovery path. How do you think the A AIIB can help to build the world better for the future? 
uh, we we would uh, uh, strike a proper balance uh, between the physical infrastructure investment and investment in the social uh, sector, such as healthcare, uh, which is very much important. And COVID-19 has laid bare the vulnerability of so many countries, uh, which are which are really very weak uh, in health sector. So we now understand uh, that it's very important for us to allocate resources for healthcare because only a healthy nation can be most productive. Uh, climate has come to the fore and there is this perception that uh, there is a conflict between pursuing a climate agenda uh, as well as growth. I mean, a lot of uh, developing nations tend to think there is a conflict. Is there? We in AIB are deeply committed to financing climate change mitigation. And as you know, in our new corporate strategy, we set a target of reaching 50% of our total lending for climate change mitigation by 2025. And I have announced that AIB will not do any coal firing power plants, nor any project which is functional related to coal. And this is our firm commitment, and we are doing it. And I think it, uh, people should uh, uh, understand that uh, uh, financing for, 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 for climate change mitigation does not dampen the growth of any economy. There's a fallacy that if we reduce uh, the uh, fossil fuel uh, consumption, that would uh, slow down the economic uh, growth, which is not true. Indeed, uh, investment in new technology for renewable, renewable uh, energies and to reduce GHG would be very, very good, actually, uh, drivers for economies in the long run. So I think people should understand uh, that uh, the climate change mitigation efforts and the financing will actually push for economic growth in the long run. And we are doing it. Where do you expect the financing needs? Which countries do you expect the financing needs to be most acute this year? Um, for some of the low-income countries uh, who have no capacity to recover to uh, recover to the level of pre-pandemic days and who have no capacity to produce vaccines. So we need to continue to support uh, some of these countries to uh, strengthen their healthcare sector and we were also financing vaccines for these countries. And some other countries probably a higher level can manage to go back to normal business uh, investment in 2021, particularly later this year, when the vaccine inoculation could be more prevalent. And I, I would say probably we can achieve uh, more positive returns in the growth. So the situation varies from country to country, and we are responsive to the needs of all of these countries. We try to cater our investment to the specific institution, uh, actual situations of these countries. And uh, I, I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all solution. Just a final question on China's economy, if I may. Is the economic recovery that we're seeing here in China sustainable, in your view? I guess so. I, I, I think so. First of all, I think the policy response to the uh, impact of pandemic has been effective, and particularly the measures to deal with COVID-19 uh, has really shown its uh, effectiveness. And uh, the government, as you know, has also announced that there will be no uh, sudden break put on the economy and the monetary policies would be, uh, would be maintained with uh, a very, very fine tuning, probably, which will not dampen the growth. And fiscal policies would play its role also. So a very good combination of the monetary policy and fiscal policies plus the very good uh, policies for the private sector development can help China to sustain its economy. And I'm actually uh, uh, very much optimistic about the even faster growth in China in 2021.